Hi, welcome to the next part of our virtual tour series. Today we're going to highlight our mammal collection. Alright, so let's, just like our other days, talk a little bit about the history of our mammal collection. So, our mammal collection was kind of established in 1946. A doctor, a medical doctor by the name of Dr. Johnson started working in Tacoma and he had a very large personal mammal collection. So he didn't really work for the museum or the university, but he had a large collection of mammals that he contributed to the already established herpetology and ornithology collections. And this was kind of the last piece for our museum to kind of be a total museum altogether. By numbers, our mammal collection is the largest. It doesn't take up as much space as our bird collection, but that's because a lot of it is gonna be little rodents and it's very easy to keep a lot of little rodents in drawers next to each other. So we have thousands of them and you'll get the chance to see some of them. Uh, the style of this video is gonna be very similar to our bird collection where I'm just gonna probably cut to different drawers that I'm showing because we have just so many mammals, I couldn't possibly show you all of them. So I hope you enjoy this little highlight reel of cool mammals that I put together for you. So let's get into it. I figured we would start over here with our mammal teaching collection. So you might have remember me saying that in our bird video as well, that our collection is kind of split into two pieces. We have a teaching collection and a research collection. You might be wondering what like decided the fact that this squirrel was gonna be a teaching squirrel instead of a research squirrel. And the answer is it's all based on the amount of data we have on that specimen when it's donated. So to, for something to be a good research specimen, we need to know things like when it was found, the date, the time, uh, where it was found, so a location on that animal, and if you know a cause of death or anything like that. So the more information we have on an animal, the more valuable it is as a research specimen. But if we don't get all that information when it's donated to us, then that animal is gonna be put into our teaching collection. Our teaching collection are the animals that we can be a little more hands-on with. A lot of times they'll have sticks on them. I don't know if these guys have sticks. Let's see if I can find someone with a stick. Let's see, ah, uh, here. So like this beaver has a big stick, so that way we can pick it up and handle it. Um, and then kids can actually touch these when we go out to events. We use the back of two fingers going with the fur. That way we don't get our oils on it so they last a little longer. And that way these teaching specimens make great ambassadors for their species and they could teach people about that animal. So yeah, so like I was saying, these are all the animals we would take out to different events. What's interesting is uh, you might notice with our mammals that all of their bones are stored next to them. Right? In our bird video, yes, in our bird video, none of the bones are stored with the birds, but mammals, bones stay with the mammals. And that's just kind of how natural history collections have gone. Uh, all the bird bones are stored in a different place away from the skins. Well, for mammals, for some reason, they just decided that bones were gonna stay with the mammals. It's because um, ornithologists and mammalogy collections were kind of started individually, so they kind of both got their own practices without each other, and then the traditions have just stayed. This is a cool guy right here. This is a North American porcupine. Okay. He has his little quills right here. You might have heard like the legend of porcupines being able to shoot their quills. These guys cannot actually shoot those quills, uh, what happens is an animal might like back up into them and then sprint the other way really fast So it looks like they were shot, but they don't actually shoot off okay. Let's see. Uh, Right now we're looking at part of our rodent research collection So I just wanted to give you guys a quick glimpse about what I meant by us having a whole lot of rodents I mean, a whole lot of mammals. So yeah, mammals are the bulk of our collection because look how many we can just kind of store together in one little drawer. And just like birds, each individual in the collection has its own spot. These are all organized by species, by dates and times. So each one has its exact spot that we like to keep it in. Another group of animals we're able to store a whole lot of together are gonna be our bats. And there are a few different, like there's lots of species of bats, but they all kind of fit into a few different roles. 
Uh, the most common types of bats we're gonna have here in North America are gonna be these littler species of bats that are gonna mostly focus on eating insects. So they fly around the forest at night using their echolocation and they're great pest control. All right? They're wonderful for helping us deal with lots of insects we don't like. Uh, their wing structure is very interesting because their wing is basically the same thing as our hand. So these long bones right here, those are the same as our finger bones, okay? And then that would be their arm. Right. So yeah, like I said, that's gonna be mostly what we have here in North America. In our collection, we have two vampire bats. So everyone's always curious about the vampire bats. So let's take a look at them. So they kind of look the same, right? They kind of look like, they're a, they're a little bigger, but these are the only two vampire bats. Uh, they're from Mexico. They're, they fly around, they like make little incisions, mostly on bigger mammals, a lot of time livestock, and they lick up just a little bit of the blood and then they leave. But like, they look very similar to these bats and these bats, which are gonna be more insect eaters. And then we do have a few very big flying fox tropical bats. So these are fruit eating bats. Their main diet's gonna be fruit, unlike our smaller bats who mostly eat insects. Uh, they can be found in much warmer tropical areas. This one in particular is found in the Philippines. Yep, Philippines. But they can also be found in Africa and South America as well. Most of our collection is Pacific Northwest focused, but we are lucky enough to have some interesting tropical species from other places and countries. Right here we have some sloths that can be found in South America. They have these long claws for helping them climb around trees and grab their food. Uh, they mostly are herbivores, hanging out in trees, eating leaves. You know, we all know them for being very, very slow. Under them we have these tree climbing anteaters known as tamandawas. Right? These guys are also found in South America. They have long claws for digging up ant hills to find their food. But they actually don't ever dig to, like deep enough to kill the queen. That way they can keep going back to the same ant net, ant hives over and over. These guys are interesting because they're, like I said, they're tree climbing. So they have a prehensile tail that helps them grab and climb onto the trees. And then behind them, we have armadillos. So armadillos found in Central and South America, also gonna be found in North America a little bit, like in Texas, Florida, Alabama. They have their hard shell that they can kind of hunch over and defend themselves. Only one species can all the way roll up into a ball. So instead what they'll do is they'll kind of hunch over and tuck in a little bit to hide like their head and tail. But yeah, it's not a full ball that they can go into. They also have claws for digging, a long snout to help them. They eat bugs, but they'll also eat berries and stuff. Right. So what's interesting is those three animals I just showed you our anteater, I mean our anteaters, our armadillos, and our sloths, okay, they're all pretty closely related. They're in the same order. So they're in the order Xenarthrins. That is, this is an example of convergent evolution where, I mean, no, divergent evolution. This is divergent evolution where closely related animals look very, very different because of just different environmental pressures that they go under and their like way of life and stuff like that. Now, on the opposite end, I wanna take a look at these guys. Right. These are pangolins, okay? They might look like they're mixes of it, all the other stuff we looked at, right? They have claws that look like they might be for digging and stuff. These guys eat insects, so they'll dig into like ant hives and stuff. Okay, they look like they have an armor plating, kind of like an armadillo. It's a little different. They have individual hardened scales instead of like a bony plate like the armadillos do. But these guys are from Asia and Africa. 
and they're their own group. They're their own order. They're actually more closely related to like cats and dogs than they are to those other groups. So this one is convergent evolution, where they look similar to something they're not closely related to, but that's because of similar environmental pressures, because they're living in a warm tropical place, focusing on the same diet. We actually have a mammal family tree here, so you can see. Uh, so Xenarthra, the green box one, that's those sloths, anteaters, and armadillos, while Phyllodota is the penguins, and they're very far apart. This cabinet here is our Canidae cabinet. So Canidae is the family that dog-like animals belong to. So foxes, coyotes, wolves. We have a cool, a couple few, we have a few cool specimens in here. Sorry about that, that I wanted to talk about. So first let's start with these two. Looking at these two things, they look like they'd be very different animals, right? But they're both the same species. This is an Arctic fox. During the summer, they have a nice gray thin coat to help them like seal the heat and kind of blend in with the dirt and sand in their area. But then during the winter, they grow in this thick white coat. So that helps with staying warm in this very snowy Arctic. And also it helps them blend in with the snow. All right, we have a few other foxes in here. Uh, here are just a bunch of different kit foxes we have. We have, da -da, let's see, we have a red fox, very soft, full red fox. These boxes right here, those are going to be the skulls and other bones. Let's see if I can get this open with one hand. Uh -huh. So yeah, like I said, mammals, we keep the skeletons with the bodies. Just that's tradition. That's how it's done in mammalogy. We have a couple of full coyotes that have managed to fit in these drawers. All right, so two just full coyotes in here, which coyotes are kind of like the biggest end of animal that we could fit in the drawers. Once you get anything bigger than the coyotes, uh, you have to start, we only keep the face. So let's take a look at our red wolves. Oh, I'm gonna drag this guy's out. So with the red wolves, since their bodies are so big, we only keep the heads. And that's the thing that happens with, I could show you our bears. So we do that with bears, we have a couple of just lion heads. Uh, red wolves are a very cool animal. They are from southern, the southern United States uh, and like the eastern side of the United States, but they were hunted near extinction. So at one point they were down to 12 individuals. Uh, but here in Tacoma, the Point to Find Zoo actually uh, made a big deal and they took in those 12 individuals and started a breeding program for them back in, uh, Ooh, I can't remember the date. I think it might have been like the 70s or 80s. I'm not 100% sure. But they were able to take those 12 individuals and breed them back up. So now there are, I think, about 240 individuals. Only 40 in the wild, but 200 in zoos. So they have a stable zoo population that we can hopefully hope them balance back from. Because I just mentioned our bears when I was talking about the wolves, I figured I'd come over here and show you our small little bear section. Oh, let's get this. So we actually have a full gri adult grizzly bear head and then an adult polar bear head. It's kind of hard to see here. As well as, uh, I'm gonna say this is a juvenile polar bear paw. Full grown polar bear is gonna be much bigger or maybe this was dried in a funny position. This is gonna be our like large herbivore section. So our like uh, the family of deers. So first we have a moose. Just look how massive a moose's head is. Like, that's crazy big. Like, that's half of, that's like my whole forearm is a moose. And then we have some antlers up here. Um, under our moose, we have other species of deer. We have some fawns that we have stored here. We have some white-tailed deer. Oh, it's still very big. The moose is the biggest of the deer family, but our other species of deer are still just very big. And under that, we also have some elk. 
We have a whole lot of elk. The last spot I want to take you on our mammal tour is one of the coolest places in the museum. And sorry for the bad joke, by that I mean this is our fur room, which is a giant refrigerator. It is currently at 45 degrees. Um, it's pretty loud in there, so I'll probably just tell you about it out here and then we'll take a look. But it's a giant refrigerator because these pelts don't fit in these nice cabinets that we have for our other specimens. Uh, these cabinets are designed to help keep insects out because uh, the worst damage that happens to a museum collection is insects that come and eat the fur, the feathers, the skin. But the pelts are so big we can't fit them in here. So I'm, we're going to go in and take a look. I'll try to talk about some of the furs, but it is a little loud. So just like the rest of our collection, this is um, organized by species. So here are some fox pelts some bobcats, wolverines, all sorts of different seal pelts. Yeah. And people are allowed to come in here during tours and touch, take them around. Here's some wolf pelts. And then a lot of our interesting tropical species, I mean not tropical, but exotic species are gonna be in here. So this right here is actually a big polar bear pelt. Okay. So polar bears have actually clear fur. Um, if you hold up like one hair by itself, they're kind of clear. And it's just because there's so many together that they look white and that helps protect them. These like hard tube furs. Okay, we also have a musk ox, another like cold weather species. Uh, some leopards in here. All right. We have some undonated like their mountain lion rug. So this is, uh, we only have like a couple of these like taxidermy rugs. We have these two cats. So it's a little loud here. So I'm probably going to get out. Give you one last look around. All the different furs. Thank you for joining me for the mammal part of our virtual tour. I hope you enjoyed it.